So thank you for joining us for today's webinar, focusing in on invasive species of photographic journey. Today, ISCBC research staff will guide you through the uh, photograph photography invasive species. You'll learn how to use these great photographs to report invasive species so that you can contribute to citizen science in your community. Nick Wong, ISCBC's project coordinator, has diverse experience working in the Pacific salmon and herring fisheries in BC, consulting and quality assurance, and has a PhD in marine ecology from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Nick has been extensively involved in the coordinated response to the Japanese beetle invasion in Vancouver, helping with facilitation, outreach, and education. He is passionate about photography and helping people learn about the role they can play in preventing the spread of invasive species. And at this point, I'll pass the mic over to you, Nick, and I hope everyone enjoys the webinar. Great. Thanks very much, Caitlin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and, and thanks for taking the time to join us today uh, to a, a little photographic journey. So uh, like Caitlin, Caitlin mentioned, I'm the research and projects coordinator, and I, and I love to hate invasive species and, and really enjoy uh, taking pictures. I'm joining you today from Coquitlam, and I'm grateful to live, work, and play on the unceded traditional territory of the Quay-Quitlam First Nation. So for the first time in 2017, BC, the BC government proclaimed May as Invasive Species Action Month, and it's to raise awareness of invasive species and encourage the public to take action. Uh, invasive species threaten BC's economy, uh, environment, and society, including human health. But stopping invasive species is possible if we take action to prevent, detect, and manage them. Pre prevention is the most cost-effective invasive species management option. So if you leave with one uh, single piece of information today, it's, it's to remember that uh, prevent, prevent, prevent. So then I just want to preface uh, this before we start that this isn't really a, a photography 101 course, more or less going to share some some information uh, around taking pictures and reporting and tell a couple stories and hopefully we can we can have some laughs along the way here. So just in case you uh, aren't overly familiar with the ISCBC, we're the largest provincial charity, invasive species charity in Canada. And we focus on uh, education, outreach training uh, on invasive species in the province. So, uh, and we're also a founding member and co-chair of the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. Uh, we also work with a variety of local governments and other regional invasive species organizations on clean, drain, dry programs, uh, don't let it loose, uh, like your unwanted pets, um, buy local, burn local, so uh, not moving any forest pests around through firewood, play, clean, go, sort of recreational activities, and, and plant-wise, which is more of a home gardener, sort of... Uh, influencing and, and promoting the, the sale and planting of native plants. Anyway. So since you're here, you do have a, an interest in invasive species. And, and if you didn't already, you'll become inevitably more familiar with them. I'm sorry to say that now, but uh, it's too late for you. You've forever been ruined. Uh, uh, invasive species have penetrated your brain like the roots of knotweed growing through concrete. You can no longer go for a walk, innocently peer into your neighbor's backyard, go for a hike or travel, or basically go anywhere <laughs> without seeing invasive species. Apologize to them now, uh, because you'll likely annoy your family, annoy your friends, uh, you'll probably annoy your pets too, but uh, all jokes aside, remember you're doing it for a good reason, you're helping to protect and preserve BC's amazing species and, and ecosystems and, and what makes it such a special place. And if you, you also like to nerd out a little bit like me, you're also adding precious uh, data points. So firstly, uh, if it's safe to do so, you wanna take multiple pictures uh, in focus from, from different angles. Uh, you want to do this safely. Don't be pulling off a, a dangerous highway to report some scotch broom or risk getting stung, getting real up close to some uh, an unknown ant nest. So please be safe. Um, 
why would multiple photos be important? So there's a lot of invasive species that can be cryptic or look like something native or even another invasive species. So in these instances, a, a couple of photos is really important to help provide a proper visual ID. And when it could come down to something like a, a leaf shape or a wing shape, it's really all in the details. So try and take uh, sort of high quality photos and, and sort of similar to the golden rule, just think about the people who have to look at these, look and go through these photos and, and sit in their shoes. Uh, in many cases, these people will be checking lots and lots of photos and reports on a weekly basis. Uh, uh, one of our staff has been uh, diligently checking Asian giant hornet reports and last year, Tina checked over 250 individual reports. So uh, make, try and make it easy on, on everyone and take really good photos. So as an example, uh, we've got the knotweeds. These are possibly uh, one of the planet's worst invasive species in the UK. People can't get mortgages or, or sell their properties if it's infested with knotweed. It can grow through concretes and foundations and it spreads really easily through uh, fragmentation of, of different plant parts. So if you weed whack it or you break off some rhizome or root, uh, it can grow back immediately. So uh, avoid doing that. So it was originally, from what I understand, in North, brought to North America, kind of like bamboo as an ornamental sort of privacy screen. And initially, the ones that came to, to North America was uh, a clone uh, that was sterile, so it didn't produce seeds. And so, therefore, it would only reproduce vegetatively. So, you know, maybe it won't get out of control. But unfortunately, also comes comes along giant, giant knotweed, which... Uh, those two cross, and now we have bohemian knotweed, which can spread by seed and by vegetative fragmentation. And I think we that's most of the, we mostly deal with bohemian and Japanese knotweed. So looking at these top four pictures, it's not overly easy to distinguish the species. So at first glance, it's usually uh, a good to get a bit of a wider landscape shot to get a size of the infestation. And then, uh, so luckily uh, the Report Invasives app asks you to, uh, to estimate this size. So. so moving on, yeah, we've got our four species uh, along the bottom. And so in this case, I would totally consider taking uh, multiple pictures. If we look now at the leaf shape um, for plants, for instance, uh, you'll notice they all are a little bit different. Himalayan knotweed on the right is pretty drastically different, but uh, the other three kind of vary just uh, based on the leaf base shape. So unless you kind of took a picture of that, um, it may be a little more difficult to check. So with plants, you could consider root structure or flowers or uh, seeds or, or if it's in a rosette, the, these types of things. So if I were to report the common periwinkle that's outside my window in the park here, um, these are some of the pictures that I would, I would consider looking at. Uh, if it was a more serious EDRR species, I'd for sure report it. But uh, like I said, with the knotweeds, I'd get a wider landscape shot uh, to get a sense of the size of the patch of periwinkle. So that's on the left. And then I'd also just, you know, get, a, get another closer up picture of the, of the flowers. There is a, a common periwinkle and big periwinkle in, in, uh, BC, in different parts of BC. So there are some uh, other species. Now we move on to uh, the largest hornet species in the world, which uh, arrived on our doorstep last year. So although the enormous size is pretty much a dead giveaway, we do have some relatively other large lookalikes in BC. But with a, a little bit of, of researcher Googling, I think it's sort of straightforward to tell the differences. So in a perfect world, these are the kind of pictures we, uh, the experts would love to see. So taking a photo along the different uh, body axes of the, of the organism, so from the front, along the side, uh, that type of thing. So apart from the sheer size, we're looking at colors, um, 
this is going to be orange and black as opposed to most uh, Vespids that we have around here, more yellow and black. Um, hairiness, uh, bees are hairy, wasps and hornets tend to be less hairy. Um, and these guys have enormous jaws. They're predators of social insects, so uh, relative to their head size, they're, they're quite large. So, but you can totally understand that this, this hornet is large and menacing and um, can totally forgive people for just pup taking a picture as quickly as they can and then, and then moving on, so. But in reality, um, these are lots of the types of pictures we receive. Don't get me wrong, we love the reports, but it's not altogether straightforward. So yeah, cons consider, please put them in focus if you can. And if you do put them in a container, um, maybe just use a flat sided container so it doesn't get distorted or anything and, and, and do your best uh, to have some good lighting. The good thing about uh, the reporting of, a of Asian giant hornet in BC is all of the positive reports we received last year were from the public. So this is gonna continue to be really important uh, this year. So these are the, some, of the, some of the native species that uh, were reported to us. And as you can see, color-wise and sort of size-wise, there's some pretty big ones. So uh, yeah, the, the paper wasps, which are pretty common, the bald-faced hornet, which is quite large as well and one of the most common ones. Um, horn tails, which you see in the center. A lot of people were pretty scared of this one because you see that long stinger-like ovipositor on the, on the end of the abdomen. So, it, it's not a stinger, it's, it uses to lay eggs in the wood. And then this elm soft fly as well, which is not uh, a vespid. Um, it's, it's a fly in it, but it's, it's quite large. So um, yeah, but people are sending all kinds of images in bumblebees, June beetles without heads, like uh, all, all types of things. But I just like to echo the sentiments of Paul Van Westendorp, our uh, BC's head apiarist. If at all possible, please, I'm just going to do a little PSA for all the Vespids out there. Um, please avoid killing um, to take a picture. In so many cases of the emails, we see, oh, I found this, this murder hornet on my chair, which we don't condone the use of. Um, and I smashed it so I could get a picture. Um, we often paint Vespids as, as villainous, but we'll also be in a really tricky place uh, ecologically if everyone starts killing these things. They, they, are, they are also sort of incidental pollinators when they feed on nectar, uh, but they are predators and they help uh, gardens and farm crops by controlling pest populations and such as flies and, and caterpillars and, and beetle larvae. So please do your best to, to catch them and, and, uh, and release them if possible if it's not a Asian giant hornet anyway. So the, here's a hot tip for, for insects anyway. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has done this as a kid, but if you, if you catch a bumblebee and put it in the fridge and you can tie a string to it and then you can walk your bumblebee around a little morbid, but this is the idea behind this. So you can catch the bug in a container and just put them in the fridge for maybe 20 minutes or so, keep an eye on it. Uh, because you don't want to obviously kill them, but just give it a little shake. If it's not moving around too much, then it's probably sluggish enough for you to let it out and take a good couple pictures and then set it free. So yeah, please consider that if, uh, if um, you're not too squeamish with bugs. Another handy tip for photography is uh, adding something for scale. It's a little tougher when you're close up to something, obviously. So you've got a coin in your pocket or a pencil or, you know, hand for scale, banana for scale, that, that kind of stuff. So can be very useful. Location, location, location. So the good thing about the apps and if you're using them live and, or if not, they'll, they'll often take the GPS coordinates from from where the image is taken. But, but if not, by all means, record, if you're sending something by email, record the, the precise address if you can. GPS or longitude and latitude coordinates are helpful. And maybe any other sort of pertinent 
uh, what you could consider maybe pertinent information. There's always little note sections in the in the report and basis app. So for instance, I put uh, for a devil's club, a native plant I reported the other day that uh, inflorescence or it's starting to flower. So a little bit of uh, information uh, never hurt. So report. You, you've taken the time to maybe take these pictures, maybe you took them on your camera and you even put them on the computer. Don't let them take up hard drive and uh, on your phone or, or uh, space. You took the time to stop. So, so please do report them um, and make sure they do go to the right or optimal organization. Thankfully, most can be reported through the app, but um, certain species want to be uh, reported to, to different organizations. And I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a sense of what I'm talking about here. So if, uh, if you don't use the Report Invasives app, or um, I would suggest um, checking out our website uh, in the Take Action section, you can learn more about that and find out where you can report these apps. You can actually just QR code that uh, on your phone and that'll take you uh, to the right place as well. So the Report Invasives app itself um, is free for download for uh, Android and iPhone. And um, yeah, that's just the splash screen there. But basically you can browse by categories, uh, you can browse by species, and um, then you can also report just on, on the right-hand side here. So there's an option to add a photo, um, add some comments or notes like I described before. And if it's a plant, you can signify a bit of uh, the area of the infestation. So another tip, I know I said take multiple pictures, but uh, from what I understand, a report, in, report invasive app only accepts one, but it's always good to have these on file. Uh, if the province or whomever wants to maybe have more information, You'll, you can have those and uh, they will contact you eventually once, once uh, everyone catches up and you, you'll receive a report um, based on your findings if it's a new report or uh, they have a record of it already. I'm flying through here. So speaking to reporting to the optimal organization. So uh, for instance, the, the European green crab, um, which is uh, up along the west coast of the island, more recently been found in Haida Gwaii, and uh, more recently some specimens have been found in Blackie Spit in Surrey and Boundary Bay. It's a pretty generalist, a generalist, generalist crab, that's about the average size you're looking at there. And they're one of the world's worst invasive species. So the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, DFO, DFO would like to know if, uh, if, um, apologies. DFO would like to know uh, if you see those. So please take a, take a good photo um, across the back, uh, note the location, and note any distinguishing features. Uh, sort of the key features of this crab are the three spines in between the eyes and the one, two, three, four, five uh, towards the outer sides of the carapace and the eye. So kind of kind of here. Despite the name green, they're not always gonna be green. They could be olive or uh, yellow or brown or, or, or black. So please keep an eye out for those and report them to DFO. We also have uh, zebra and quagga mussels, which haven't been found in BC yet, but uh, please report those through to uh, the Report Invasives app. Uh, any suspected transport, release, uh, possession, or sale of invasive mussels should be reported to the BC Conservation Office, and that can go to their wrap line, uh, which you can find out more about there. 
We've got Japanese beetle, which I'm super familiar with. And, and if you're in the lower mainland and you suspect you have Japanese beetle on your property, the Canadian Food and Inspection Agency wants to hear about that one. So uh, yeah, please send this, this beetle in particular is pretty uh, unmistakable. There's nothing like this in BC. Uh, it's got this, this emerald green color. They're about a centimeter long with these uh, brown wing covers and six tufts of hair along either side of of the abdomen. So similar to the similar to the Asian giant hornet, if you can get images along the side, and if it points out those tufts of hair, it's a it's a pretty much a dead giveaway. Uh, yeah, stepping back to Asian giant hornet, please do report those using the report of Mesa's app or, or report them to us. Um, the province is very keen to hear about that. Um, so the unmated queens, I guess, that survived over winter will be sort of looking for new hives uh, sort of soonish. Um, but if, if we're going to see any, probably won't be until July. So just uh, keeping that in mind, uh, Asian giant hornet report using the app or, or directly to us, the ISCBC. Finally, well, not finally, sorry. I'd just like to um, talk a little bit about iNaturalist. Um, if you've not used it before, it's amazing, um, but there are lots of other apps out there. So uh, we'd love to hear about sort of what other apps you're using or that you find useful. So if you can throw them in the chat. Um, yeah, we're really curious uh, what other apps people are using out there. Um, so for a little bit of background, uh, I, I naturalist started as a as a couple people's master's project at UC Berkeley way back in 2008. Years later, it, it sort of went down the chain and became an initiative of the California Academy of Sciences and a joint project with National Geographic in 2017 and it's come a really long way. So it basically uses AI to compare whatever photo you report. Uh, with its entire database. I couldn't tell you how the model and the AI works, but it's all online if, if you're curious. Um, and it's a really powerful community science uh, tool, not only for just recording records, but also as a nifty identification tool, I use it all the time. So you can add uh, observations live when you're out in the field or similar to the report invasives app, you can take your pictures previously and it'll pull that information from your photos. So, uh, and you can also do it through the website. So it's, it's extremely powerful and it can uh, ID to the genus and species level if, if uh, there's enough records out there, but if not, it'll provide suggestions. So I saw a cute little uh, hooded merganser a little while back. And so you, you upload that photo and then you click on what did you see? And then it basically uh, provide, provides the genus. And then you can go, go further through and find out more about the individual species. And uh, there's a further map that you can scroll through. And, and uh, yeah, I use it constantly. So there could be a, uh, maybe even a webinar in the future on uh, iNaturalist, so, so stay tuned. The really neat thing about this is uh, this is just an idea of what's going on in Canada on iNaturalist. Lots, lots of things going on. Uh, heaps of observers out there um, contributing to this uh, to this amazing database. So uh, yeah, if you're not uh, active in the iNaturalist community, uh, give it a go. And I just wanted to sort of tell a cool story about iNaturalist that I heard about a little while ago. Um, so this is a, a, a mola mola or an ocean sunfish. We get them up in here in BC too. They're huge and they basically just kind of stick pretty close to the surface and you'll often see them lying sideways sunning themselves. Um, so these are pictures someone was walking their dog on a Santa Barbara, California beach and came upon this super weird creature and and uh, ended up coming back and taking some photos. You'll notice the, the tape measure and the ruler and the, and the little hands there, so good tips. Um, so they found this weird creature in 2019. These pictures were passed around via email and eventually uploaded to iNaturalist. Um, 
And so another aspect of iNaturalist I didn't mention is that the observations are verified. So they could be verified by experts. So that could be people in research or academia, or they can be like community graded, casual, uh, verified. Um, so after the photos were uploaded to Naturalist, here come two sunfish experts from Australia that saw the observation. And lo and behold, this was not Mola Mola, the species that we see in uh, North American waters, uh, but it was actually Mola Tecta, which was only described in 2017. And it's uh, the hoodwinker sunfish. Tecta is Latin for hidden. So they're actually native to Australia, New Zealand, Southern Chile, and Southern Africa. So it was the first time it's ever been observed in North America. So what a cool discovery. How the heck, why did it come up this far north? And, and what a neat community science story, I think. So uh, I want to leave with one thought there and just ponder as invasive species, you know, with climate change, they're expected to move too. So uh, iNaturalist could be a, a neat way to uh, look at some invasive species data as well. So, yeah, I'd just like to, I guess, leave you with my information here and a picture of a green crab I found uh, last year in Souk Harbor. Um, and yeah, if, if you do have any more information uh, or want to want to uh, ask any questions about anything invasive species related or, or photos, by all means, give me a give me a ring or an email. But uh, yeah, just to perhaps leave with some activities here. If you don't have the app, please do download it and snoop around your your alleyway or local green space or park. Hopefully not your backyard. Hopefully it's not full of invasive species. And don't report invasive species on people's and people's yards. I would I wouldn't recommend doing that. Anyway, um, uh, but yeah, challenge yourself. Get outside and maybe report something more than just uh, Himalayan blackberry. Just just in this, as an example. Uh, we'd we'd love to uh, give a little uh, promo to the What's in My Backyard photo contest. Um, We'd love people, youth and uh, youth under 30 and families and school groups or youth across BC to post invasive species kind of around and uh, the group who posts the most photos uh, will win. I know I just said, hopefully you don't have invasives in your backyard, but um, yeah. And there are some awesome prizes, including uh, some, a kayak, uh, some gift cards to Atmosphere and, and Panago and some, some neat, uh, Neat prizes. So post on Instagram and Twitter with the hashtag BC Invasives Contests and tag us or enter at bcinvasives.ca slash Wimby. So uh, yeah, that's, I guess, all from a, a photography perspective and from me. Great. Thanks, Nick, for that great presentation and for your enthusiasm on the topic. So I'd like to invite all of the attendees to um, put your questions into the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen. This is a different box than the chat box. So if you see a question in there already that's similar to your own, you can actually just upvote it. And we do have some time for some questions now. So um, Nick, while we're waiting for some questions, I'm just curious if you could share your own personal photography tips, maybe for the new beginner photographer. Uh, yeah, um, it's sort of, it kind of depends what your, what your goal is, I suppose. I, if I'm going at it with a, an invasive lens, maybe I'm sort of just looking for things that may look out of place. So maybe you want to even just take a step back and become more familiar with the native plants and species that are around. And uh, that'll help you sort of maybe focus your photography and, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, um, I like to fiddle around with a DL DSLR and, uh, and both my and the camera on my phone. So camera phones are incredibly powerful these days. So don't feel like you have to have a fancy camera to to take great photos. Um, I like to get real, just get down on my hands and knees and in the dirt and get close to my my sort of pictures. So I, I, I definitely find more pleasure in just looking and finding and taking the pictures rather than trying to complicate the technical aspects and being like, oh, my shutter speed is too slow or 
there's too much light. So I try to focus more on just, you know, getting outside and, and uh, that, that type of stuff personally. Great, thanks. I've also, I'm just getting into photography myself and I find um, I'm learning to just take a bunch of photos, like don't take a photo and, and check your photo, just, just keep shooting. <laughs> Especially if you're, you know, photographing plants or insects that are moving just to take as many photos as you can and then go back and hopefully there's one good one in that mix of like 30 to 40 photos. <laughs> yeah, you can always delete them. Definitely. And then do you have any tips for like um, taking photos of insects? As I know, it is one of the harder things to photograph because they do move quite a bit. So yourself, is there anything you found with that type of photography that helps? Definitely. Well, when it comes to maybe the Japanese beetle, for instance, uh, when it's nice and sunny out, they're going to tend to be sitting on foliage. And you'll notice there's lots of pictures, their legs will be straight out because that helps them sort of stay balanced and stuck to leaves if there's wind or something. But if they kind of notice your shadow or you hit the leaf, they're gonna instantly just jump off and try and hide in the foliage. So um, subtle movements, uh, don't try and, well, don't try and get too close, but yeah, I would say if you can catch it, um, do that. There's not many uh, Japanese beetle won't bite you. Um, I wouldn't catch an Asian giant hornet with your hand, but uh, yeah, there's not many things that uh, insects that will nip you are you. So, yeah. Great. So there is a question from a participant. Um, the question is, can invasive species like knotweed be harnessed for nutrition and thus positively controlled? Um, like an example they give is, you know, North Americans, um, people fighting against dandelions by, you know, overlooking the nutrition, but now we've learned that we can actually ingest them. Yeah, I've, I've definitely heard sort of, uh, anecdotal like stories and, and, and things from people. I, I, I don't know the actual sort of nutritional basis of of not weed, but definitely this is, uh, people do eat it for sure. So yeah, um, I can't speak to, to any recipes <laughs> or something, uh, like a nice not weed Caesar salad or something, but no, uh, I guess it's a speci species specific thing, but uh, as an organization, we don't really uh, send out recipes or anything. I just see Nick, um, our technical support popped a link into the chat there if anybody's interested for, it's a website that's all about um, eating invasive species. So if you're interested, you can find some interesting recipes there. Cool. Yeah, I, I used to, I studied crabs for my PhD that were invasive and I used to eat them all as long as they weren't uh, in from a marina or, or uh, a port, so. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions. So on behalf of the Invasive Species Council of BC and all those that are listening, thank you so much again, Nick, for your sharing your expertise with us today on the webinar. Uh, we'll be emailing all attendees a link to a short survey. If you could please take a moment to complete it and provide your feedback and ideas for future webinars, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, May is Invasive Species Action Month, so please check out what's happening in your community on our website. There's so many different ways to get involved. Um, we also invite all invasive species researchers, practitioners, and students to submit your abstract for the 2021 Invasive Species Research Conference taking place virtually from October 6th to 7th. Um, you can see a link in the chat window for more information. If you enjoyed this webinar, please consider supporting ISCBC's work by joining us as a member. Members are offered discounts on paid events and training courses, among other benefits. You can also um, visit our website to learn more. And if you live in BC and you'd like to make an impact in your community and are between the ages of 15 to 30, please consider volunteering with us. Um, you can see the link in the chat for more information. So thanks everyone and we'll see you next time.